what I want to talk about today is handling different problems with coroutines, um, with Rx, with all of this stuff that we're using daily. Um, it's important because there are many people who are switching or trying to switch their code bases to using these like modern approaches and um, we are kind of in the same boat. So we, we encountered some issues or some weird situations and that's kind of what I just want to share today. So um, quick recap of where we, where we are today um, and why did we start using Rx in the first place. So we had some issues with async tasks. So just to get a feel, who was using async task before? Okay. <laughs> okay, it's, it's a lot of people. And yeah, async tasks were difficult to manage. Scheduling was kind of weird. Defaults are wrong as usual on Android. And uh, we, we maybe used some, sometimes we used just plain threads. Um, we were abusing background services. I've seen examples of where background services were used to just run simple networks, network tasks, like spin up a background service, do the network task, then come back, stop the service. So that was also crazy. Uh, we had issues with canceling tasks. So if you run something, especially an async task, and then your app closes or something like this happens, you need to cancel this task. And then this was difficult because you would maybe sometimes cause memory leaks and so on. Um, there was there were other approaches like libraries that would offer you callbacks to everything like error like Rx offers but uh, in in a more pragmatic way uh, so you would have this callback hell where you would have one callback inside of another callback inside of another callback and it's just horrible um, so let's just quickly look at what the code looks like with Rx so we have this uh, let's say some repository we fetch some something that takes a while to complete. We can move it to another thread. We can come back to the main thread. Um, we have exactly one success callback and exactly one error callback, which was very, very convenient because you could change chain things. Um, one, of, one of the big benefits of Rx was type safety. So if you just run your code, you would at compile time be sure that this code would deliver a certain type of result. Same goes for errors. You, you could handle errors. You could defer starting your tasks. Um, you could also subscribe, as I mentioned, on different threads. You could specify your own threads or use their predefined pool. So all of this was very, very con convenient. Um, and finally, maybe one of the most important things, we would have thread safe task cancellation. So you would just call dispose or previously with subscription, you would just unsubscribe or whatever it was. But it's thread safe. You can do it from anywhere. And it basically guarantees that your result, whether it's success or error, it guarantees that your result will not get delivered. So that's pretty much why we liked Rx, why we like Rx. Um, so what are some of the problems? So it's a large third-party library. So it's built by some people from uh, Netflix and some community members and, of course, Jake Wharton. And then it's huge. It accomplishes a lot, but it's huge. And you might not need all of the features from Rx. So whether it's Rx Java or Rx JS, Swift, whatever, it's all kind of the same principle. It moves you to a reactive paradigm and you can do stuff um, easily, but there is a huge steep learning curve. So you would need to invest a lot of time to really understand what happens, how you can chain calls, how you can combine all of these operators, all of this stuff. What are operators anyway? Like you need to learn things. And when you learn a lot of things, then you can accomplish some minor task. So this was also a problem. Um, debugging, of course, if you have some huge chains and then they depend on other observables or singles or other chains, so it's like chain inside of chain, uh, it can get difficult to debug why things are happening. Um, people were re abusing reactive, reactive programming, so uh, we, were, we were, because I was also doing it at some point, doing for loops just like simple for loops using Rx. So we would go for an observable, then from iterable, and then do the for loop, and then come back to the main, like what, why? So yeah, there were a lot of things going on with Rx. Um, I, I still think it's a, good, it's a good library, it's a good tool, uh, but for its own purpose. 
Uh, if you really need it, that's fine. So what we now have is a new built-in concept, coroutines. Um, and this is what the code with coroutine, coroutines would look like. So you would launch, for example, with the launch function. And then inside of there, you would fetch some result. Maybe you would do it on some other thread, not the main thread. Um, and then you would have success, not as a callback, but just like like the next line of code. So also you would do a try catch, which is available in both Java and Kotlin, and you would just catch the exception and continue from there. So it looks simpler. You don't have to learn much. It's just like easy. Um, some of the benefits we have from Kotlin with coroutines, uh, we eliminated callbacks. We have simplified future syntax with async await. We uh, have async code that looks like synchronous code and uh, it's a small software package, so it's much, much smaller than Rx. Um, we get a cleaner stack trace. This is one of the really good things that JetBrains did, and uh, it's very difficult, actually, to do because they generate some code from your code. Um, it's built into Kotlin with an asterisk, and it easy, has easier modeling of job hierarchy than what we've seen before. And I have asterisks there because you kind of have to include one package from uh, Kotlin coroutines to be able to utilize everything that this offers. But um, the core concept, like suspending functions, like the su suspend keyword, it's in the language. So it's kind of built in, but if you want to fully use them, then you need one small package uh, extra. Um, yeah, and then the last point depends which language and which environment you come from, but uh, for me, as, as an Android developer, it was much easier to model job hierarchy with coroutines. So let's quickly recap scope versus context. So this is very, this is very interesting because I believe it's, it's misinterpreted a lot. And I just want to go quickly through what, what it all means. And because it also kind of makes sense if you want to handle problems, handle errors. So basically, uh, the white area is your parent scope or like root scope or your main scope and this scope has only one uh, element which is the coroutine context so coroutine context is made out of smaller pieces which are elements of the context and each element is a context itself so it's kind of a cheat i guess because then you can say stuff like uh, create your job which controls how your coroutine is executed and allows you to cancel it. Uh, you can also add a dispatcher, which would control where your coroutine is executed, like which thread. And you can also add some exception handler and other stuff. And all of them are elements, and you can just add them together to form a bigger context. So if you have like three items, they form your parent context. And then from this parent context, you use it to launch another job. So this is the launch function. You can add stuff, like you can add a different thread to run on. And as I've mentioned, dispatchers are also context. So you can just use a dispatcher in this bracket, and it will just create a new context for you. And what happens internally, they will merge your old context with the new context. So it's kind of, it's some kind of indexed set. It's something between set and hash map, I guess. So they will override the previous dispatcher that you had. So if you had main thread and then you specify IO, it will just override main thread but keep everything else. It may create, depending on how you configure it, depending on how you use it, it may create a new job for your child or it may create an exception handler, but it's usually just using stuff from the parent. Um, and what happens then is that you get a child scope which is inside of the parent scope. And this is the job hierarchy thing that I mentioned. So in your child scope, you also have your child context, the merged one. And when you run jobs from your child, it runs only in your child scope. So the interesting thing is, when a job fails inside of your child scope, by default, if you don't specify your uh, like special parent, your child will crash or it will error the parent. If you cancel the parent, it will, by default, again, cancel all of its children. So this kind of connection is important when, when I go into how errors happen and how, how to handle some of these problems. 
it will be very important to know that child is tied to the parent and then parent can influence the behavior of its child jobs. Okay, so on to the main point. Um, I want to make a differentiation between active and simulated work. So active work, uh, I think of active work something that keeps your CPU busy. So uh, to demonstrate some of these examples, I used just a simple while loop that just runs and keeps your CPU busy. But normally, it's, let's say, some network request. So what happens, you would be uh, parsing your data object, that is, let's say, your request body. You're parsing this uh, or converting it to JSON format, and then you are going for the network, and then you're fetching DNS, and then you're fetching where this IP is, and you're some maybe making some connection to this server. And then you're sending your JSON along with the HTTP request, and what you get in return is some response, so again, in HTTP format that you would parse and then get some response object, and then this response object d is delivered to your like business layer. So there is stuff going on. That's what I mean by active work. So there is something that is keeping your CPU busy. It's not just staying idle there. Um, and also important, it's very similar to threads. There is no way to stop execute for, okay. Uh, for threads, if you call thread.interrupt, basically it just sets a flag on the thread and someone who was executing work in that thread would need to be aware and check if the thread was interrupted or not and then stop the work. So this is very similar to how coroutines work. So you would execute some uh, block of code and then if you don't check for it, you don't know if this code should stop working or not. So this is where we have this distinction between cooperative jobs and uncooperative jobs. So cooperative ones are the ones that check, hey, am I canceled? Am I supposed to stop working now? So these are the cooperative jobs. Um, one interesting uh, exception from this are coroutine delay function, threads sleep function, and kind of similar to that, rx subscribe. So why is it different? because delay and sleep will both immediately throw an exception when you cancel them. So if you're doing thread sleep and you call interrupt on this thread, it will immediately throw an exception. It will not wait until the sleep is completed. The same goes for coroutines. If there is a delay function and you call stop or cancel, it will immediately stop and throw a cancellation exception. I'll, I'll go into, into more details. Um, but so I created, I created an app uh, it's pretty simple, like there's a list of tasks that you can execute and you can just tap to execute it. What I'm interested in, so it, they can complete successfully or uh, unsuccessfully, and I have this filter here that says throw exception. So if I, if I click it, it will wait for the task to complete and then instead of just returning success, it will throw an exception. So this is what I'm looking for. I want to know when my app will crash. What will happen with my app if something goes wrong? with my work. Um, and then there is also one more filter that says simulate work. So as I mentioned, doing active work mean, means that you're keeping your CPU busy. Simulating work is using delay. So when I say simulate work, it will not loop, it will just call delay. So it, it appears that it's working, but it's actually not. So from the components that you might be interested in, so I just have a couple of UI things here, um, and then important thing is on stop. So on stop in this fragment that is running will try to cancel all of the jobs that are running, which is what actually one job because you click it and it gets disabled. But in any case, it's on stop will try to stop all the jobs that are running. They it will try to cancel. Um, so this is what, this is kind of what it looks like. So doing actual work is just looping and I wait for two seconds. And then simulating is a suspending function, means that it takes long, and it just calls delay. So it's, we'll see how this is different. So I have, uh, I have a couple of very common use cases. I, I talked to people and I also checked on, on the internet and all of these tutorials and, and conference talks. So there are kind of five most common use cases where we use coroutines. So um, just to be able to to show you what happens in some of these cases, let's just see first what the base context or base scope looks like for me. So my fragment, 
uh, you shouldn't maybe do it like this, but it's a, like a demo app. So I didn't do any layering. I just crammed everything into one fragment. Don't do it. Um, so the coroutine scope, it has one, one element only that is mandatory, which is the coroutine context. I'm creating the coroutine context by adding one parent job, dispatchers.main, and the default handler. So what does this mean? Um, so the, one of the things is default handler. So there is a, an exception handler that you can attach to your context. So when your coroutines fail, this exception handler will be invoked. So I want this. You, you're, not, you, you're not supposed to add it all the time if your code doesn't crash, if it's just a loop. You, you don't have to add it. You can just skip it. But in my, my case, I wanted to test what happens. So if I don't add this default exception handler and my coroutine crashes, the app will crash. So that's what I'm trying to detect. I'm trying to detect which cases will crash my app. So this is the default exception handler. If I catch it there, my app crashes, unless I keep the default exception handler. Um, so I have another thing. What I mentioned on stop is canceling all the children from this job. And then I have... Uh, the parent job, which is a supervisor job. So th there is a difference between a normal job and a supervisor job. And supervisor will allow your children to fail and to get canceled without any effect on the parent. So if your child job crashes, you can still run other jobs from the same uh, parent scope. Um, and before we go any further, I also want to explain dispatchers.main. This doesn't mean that all work will run on the main thread. It means that just the start of the work will start on main thread. And then whatever thread you use when you're launching your coroutines will be respected still. But then the result will also come back to the dispatchers.main. So it will start on main thread and end on main thread. But you can switch thread manually anywhere. There is another approach where you would start from a different thread and then manually switch back to the main thread. I prefer this one more. Um, there is, I think, I think there is no other reason. Like, I just prefer this way. Um, okay, so the, f uh, the use cases are run blocking, which will convert your normal non-coroutine code into something that where you can use coroutines. So the block inside of run blocking is a coroutine scope. It's a it's a coroutine function, so it's a suspending function, and basically what I do is just show some progress, then run for get some result, and then show success, and then catch an error if it's uh, if it's happening. And why why do I retrow it? Because I want to catch it in that default exception handler and see what happens. Will it crash my app without the default exception handler or not? So this is case one, run blocking. Case two, launch. It, it's exactly the same code. It just uses launch instead of uh, run blocking. Uh, case number three is async await. So there, async is executing the task, getting some value from it. And then in the next line, I'm calling await on this result. This is the simplified future syntax that I mentioned. So it's kind of similar to launch, and we'll see. Um, the fourth one is with context. So you launch some work, and then you switch to an IO thread. This is what you, be do what you should be doing. So switch to IO thread or some, uh, any thread that will not block the UI. And then outside of this with context block, I'm back on the main thread implicitly. Uh, and then I show success or a show result. And case number five, coroutine scope. Uh, basically, coroutine scope is very similar to run blocking in the sense that it will wait for all of the children to complete. But it's also one of the common use cases and we'll see what happens. So five use cases. Let's see what happens. So uh, I'll show you a table um, of results. So basically, it's five columns where this is the five use cases, run blocking, launch, async, with context, and coroutine scope. And there are also three rows. So the first row is just running it from the current base fragment. Just run it as is. The second one is reuse the parent. And the third one is attach another handler to see whether this new handler will catch the exception or the default uh, handler will catch the exception. So um, without any further ado, so this is the table. Um, as you can see, the red ones, they are thread blocking. And this is actually while actively looping. So when I do a while loop for two seconds, 
all of these cases will block my main thread for two seconds. So that's weird. Um, and then also some of them, like using launch, using async scope, and especially run blocking, they will crash the app. And additionally for run blocking, default exception handler is not invoked. So for run blocking, it will crash the app. It will not go to the default exception handler at all. So this is disturbing, interesting. And let's see why. So if you want to run run blocking, if you want to run blocking code with Rx and with coroutines, so with coroutines you would say run blocking and then run it. With Rx you would use uh, blocking get, for example, and that would basically stop your thread for, from continuing and just subscribe to the original observable or single, whatever it is, and then complete it when done, then continue the current thread. So how, how is it different? Coroutines use a uh, thread local event loop internally. So there is some loop that is picking up stuff from the dispatchers. In this case, it's a main dispatcher. Uh, it starts a new empty context where you can just run your co uh, suspending code inside and then calls join for all the children that are inside. So it's kind of similar to what a coroutine scope would do. It would wait for all children, children to complete. But since run blocking is creating a thread local event loop, this event loop will be blocked. And then there is no other way but to block. And after blocking, it throws an exception on the current thread. So it's not scheduled. It's actually blocking the current thread. And when you throw an exception from the current thread, it goes to the thread exception handler, in my case, none, and it crashes the app. With uh, Rx, just to compare, it uses a wait, so it creates some threads inside, and then it calls a wait, and continues also the same way in the current thread, and also waits for all the children to complete. But in, the, in case of Rx, it's just the chain of observables, one inside of the other, and then it waits, waits for all of them to complete. So this, was, this, was why, this is why it's crashing. And you should kind of avoid it, the, avoid the run blocking. But we can continue looking at the launch, and async. So if you open the source code for launch, uh, this is what you have. So you can specify a context. You don't have to. By default, it goes to empty coroutine context. Uh, start, by default, it just starts. It's not, it's not lazy. And finally, there is a block of code that is a suspending function that, you get, that gets executed uh, as soon as the coroutine starts. So the only difference between launch and async is kind of in this p in this area so you here you have let's say a standalone coroutine whereas let's say the async one just runs a deferred coroutine so it kind of merges so this line a new coroutine context kind of misleading because it doesn't create uh, it doesn't create a new context from scratch. It merges the current parent context with the child context. So whatever you specify, like IO thread, it gets merged. So the name is kind of misleading. It should be new coroutine context from, uh, to be more accurate. And yeah, it also runs on the main dispatcher because my parent context had a main dispatcher and errors are, are delivered to the resolved handler because now we are actually creating coroutines and running them. And this is all happening in the coroutines like mechanism. And that's why we get errors delivered to the default exception handler. Uh, if you compare to async, as I mentioned, this is the only real difference. So they create a deferred coroutine um, instead of a standalone coroutine. So the difference would be async would give you some result and launching would just give you a job to cancel. Um, so that's the that's the main difference. But similarly, um, it also will create a new merged context. Again, the same line, new coroutine context. It will create a merged context. So it will still use the main thread, and it will still block the main thread. Um, it will call a wait. You can call a wait, and um, a waiting will block. It's blocking. So the main the main point is here. You are using a active job, so looping. While looping, your coroutine is doing some work. So when you block, say join, 
it will wait for this work to complete unless this work is cooperative. Unless it checks, let's say, every iteration, hey, am I cancelled? Yes, then stop. So this is, the, this is the important thing. So let's now see how is this different from using delay. Because we also use delay in some cases, like when there was user, uh, when there was some backend slowness or something, and you would need to wait for a while to, and then show the message, hey, sorry, it's wait, uh, it's taking a bit longer. Please still wait, don't leave. So in this case, we would use delay. It's pretty simple, uh, but as you can see, delay is not blocking anything. So that's also interesting. But the run blocking function will crash still. And what is interesting is that now launch, async, or coroutine scope, they are not blocking anymore. And the reason for this is that delay is actually not doing any work. So if you take a look at here, this is again from the coroutine uh, source. And so there is like schedule, completed, dispose. It's not doing any actual work. It's just like parking and unparking. It's queuing things in the event loop that I mentioned and then pulling things out of this event loop. So it's not doing any work. It's just sitting there until the next event loop pass and then the event loop says, oh, timer expired for this one. I'll pull it in. So this is what happens. That's why delay is different. So there are two more use cases for canceling tasks canceling the, the tasks that run uh, and do active job, and then canceling tasks that are just simulating work. So it's also different. First of all, uh, I want to wake you up with this really white slide. And let's see what happens if you search is cancellation exception in the coroutines source code. So you get 30, 30 results. This was. Uh, a while back, like probably two months, but I I'm thinking it, it's just more than 30. So cancellation exception is a very, very special exception in coroutine world. It's kind of similar to inter thread interrupted exception, but it's even more special because they handle it in many cases. They handle it specially. Um, and to be able to compare properly, so let's see what happens with Rx. So with Rx, if you have some job, doesn't matter if it's like a timer job, which is simulating work, or it's like a real while loop or network call, doesn't matter. If you call dispose on an Rx disposable, it will may it may let the job run until the end, but it will not report any result. It will not report error. It will not report success. It just stops listening to whatever happened. Um, then also important, disposable, if you call dispose on it, it goes upstream. So all of the uh, chained observables that you put on top of each other, like map, flat map, uh, two single, la la la. So all of them get disposed and none of them will report result. That's why you don't get anything from it. So that's why it's safe. On stop, you just call dispose, you're done. It's super easy. Um, can you cancel a substream of Rx from outside of uh, the chain. So this is what would some kind of flat map uh, implementation look like. It's simplified, but what happens is you have some uh, item, and then it gets split into two items and into a different stream. So you get a stream of streams inside. But they make it really, really nice and easy for you. And in the end, what you, you c when you call subscribe, you have one success and one error callback. So you would get each of the elements in a single stream. But internally, they do have two streams. And exceptions, if you have an exception in the end, it will uh, get delivered directly to your final stream. So why is this important? Um, well, because you cannot actually cancel the inner streams without using some reflection or some other dark magic, and there is no way. So you would, you would need to be aware of each individual inner stream and then keep a reference to them somewhere which breaks the functional programming paradigm. You shouldn't be keeping any references. You should be like having a flow. So that's what's different with, with coroutines. You can access child jobs and you can cancel child jobs. So. When you want to cancel, what happens by default, if you're doing uh, active loop, 
so the table will show you it's kind of weird again. So you're doing some active work, looping for two seconds, and then you call cancel. So it's still it's it's thread blocking, but also some of these some of these crash. And why why do they when I say crash I mean they deliver stuff to the default exception handler, which is essentially the same as crash if you don't have one. So why why does this happen actually? Um so remember that my base fragment was running on the main thread, so it expects the results to get delivered back to the main thread. On stop is an Android callback that is also scheduled on the main thread. So if I'm doing some work on the main thread and blocking the main thread, my on stop callback will get delivered later. Only when all of my work on the main thread is finished, then I will get then the next message will get executed. So that's why it crashes. It basically completes all of the work and then throws an exception because I want it to crash. And then it would call on stop, but unfortunately we had an exception and the work is over. The job is canceled. Async is different in this case because async will actually schedule error delivery and it will not stop even like if difference from Rx, you call dispose, you do not get errors. With async, um, these use cases will give you an error. And I actually checked this with one of the uh, authors of coroutines. I checked it on one of the tickets and they said that this, this behavior is very intentional because you might want to treat your exceptions even if the job is canceled. So this is one big difference from Rx, for example. Um, to mention a couple more important things. So if you want to play nicely with others and you're writing code that is um, suspending, you should check, you have this flag now. It, it didn't, it wasn't available before, but it was recently released. So now we have is active on each scope. So if you're running a coroutine inside of it, you will have this is active flag by default. So they will do some uh, searching, they will look for coroutine context, and they will take a job from it and then check if the job is active. But in any case, you can check if your job is active. So if you're doing some, a couple of network calls, let's say using different retrofit clients, or maybe one is using GraphQL, one is using uh, just plain HTTP, REST, whatever. So you have different things going on. You need to check uh, whether your coroutine is active because otherwise you are doing work that you should not be doing because someone canceled your job. And this is why my, uh, my examples crashed the app. I never checked in the while loop, hey, is it active? I just continue working. And that's my, my jobs are uncooperative. Whereas normally production quality jobs should be cooperative. Um, another important thing is that suspend modifier doesn't mean that you're creating a new scope, doesn't mean that you're creating a new context. It just means that you're aware that your code might run um, in a coroutine scope. It might be slow, so that's why you're marking your functions with a suspend modifier. Um, yeah, and then if you really want to play nice, so you would check before throwing an exception, you would check if the job is canceled or not. And this is also one thing that I didn't do in my jobs. So before throwing the exception, I should check, hey, am I canceled? And if yes, I should throw a cancellation exception. And as I mentioned, cancellation is extremely specific and coroutines mechanism will take care of it. It will not deliver a result. So that's the caveat. Um, compared to Rx, in Rx, you are not aware of being in, in a chain. So if you say from iterable, your iterable has no idea that it's in a chain. If you say from callable, your callable block doesn't know that it's in a chain. The only way to be aware that you are in some kind of Rx chain is to use observable.create or single.create where you would get some kind of argument on the top where you can check, am I still running, am I disposed, and then manually del deliver results. But like default code, from Rx is not aware that it's in an Rx chain. Whereas with coroutines, you are always aware that you're in a coroutine scope, that you're in a suspending function because there is either a suspend modifier or and or you can check if your job is active or not from anywhere from within the scope. And there is one more 
there's one more interesting use case that I haven't mentioned, and this is coroutine scope, and then I'll quickly go to canceling uh, simulated tasks. So coroutine scope is usually used to, um, to decompose work. So if you want to do three or four things in parallel, you would use a coroutine scope because coroutine scope guarantees that all of your tasks will complete until the parent, uh, um, yeah, it will guarantee that all of your ch children will complete and then the parent will complete. So this is wha one of the main use cases why you would use a coroutine scope. So in this case, I have stuff like uh, getting this data and then running in this event dispatcher and then collecting other events and then sending some other event, then finally displaying some message. Um, so I'm doing a couple of things and they're, they're all, all of them should happen kind of in, in at the same time and they should all wait for each other and the coroutine scope should wait until everything completes. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned, these three collect events with context and display, they might block something here and the coroutine scope will block because of it. So if you, I'll show you more examples um, for canceling coroutine scopes, but just one more interesting thing. So canceling coroutines with on stop, but just canceling them uh, from doing simulated work. So they're not actively looping and surprisingly or not surprisingly at all, none of them are blocking except for the run blocking because it's very special. So none of them are actually, none of them are actually doing any work. The delay function is scheduled somewhere on this event loop and it waits. So when I call cancel, it just takes the delay function off the event loop nothing happens. So there are no consequences if you're using delay. So what is interesting here is that coroutine scope, the fifth one, is behaving differently from run blocking. And as I mentioned also, coroutine scope is also waiting for all the children to complete, same as run blocking, but run blocking will block the current thread and coroutine scope will schedule something to be executed in the next uh, event loop pass. So that's, that's the main difference. Run blocking will always, always, whatever you do, wait for its children to complete and block the current thread when you call um, run blocking function. In that, in that moment, it will block. And connected scopes, as I said, there is one more interesting example. So let's say we have this coroutine scope, we are fetching some data, we have some other contexts, we are running, delivering these events, and then we are displaying a message. So uh, let's say the repository call fails here, um, which is a very common use case, like you can lose network connectivity or I don't know, you forgot to update your uh, network models or something, it crashes. Um, so what will happen here is that in the other place where you are calling for this data, so you get the data from async function and you are waiting for the data here. So if the top one throws an exception, the bottom one will never execute. So the coroutine scope and the whole coroutines mechanism, they will take care that this part here is never executed. It's especially important if you're, for example, expecting data to be non and null, and here it might be null, and you don't have like this question dot, you're just using dot as if it's non null. So it's, there are multiple reasons, and the way they schedule it, they split this work into a couple of uh, parts. So the repository get data would be one part, and then collecting other events would be the second part, sending the event would be the third part, and fetching the sent uh, variable would be the fourth part, and then displaying would be the fifth part. And so they try to execute it in order, this is, all of this happens behind the scenes, so you don't see it, but it happens. And then if any of these fail, everything else is stopped. None of the work will get done because you're depending on this data await. S um, yeah, so similarly, similarly to this, you might need this sent variable here to display the message. And if your sent variable is unavailable because, I don't know, this function might throw an exception, this one will not get executed. So it will just stop and your coroutine scope will deliver the exception to its exception handler. So they will take care of error handling in this particular case and they will do it quite well. 
So yeah, to go back to the key takeaways, um, I know I focused a bit more on coroutines than on Rx, but again, Rx is widely used and coroutines are not yet. And so just to, to go back quickly, with Rx you get a single stream kind of, and you have one reaction at the end. So it's kind of functional style. Uh, cancellation will not deliver errors. So if you cancel, the error will not get delivered. Whereas with coroutines, for example, with async, your async code needs to be aware and it might deliver an exception and that's intentional. Um, cancellation exception is inexistent in Rx. It's not an exception. It just doesn't happen. It, your code just stops working. Um, you don't have to throw away if you Rx. If you're using Rx and you're happy with Rx, you don't have to throw it away. So it's not like you need to switch to coroutines now. Um, you don't have to. Both of them do the work that they're supposed to do. Um, it's just that Rx is bigger and it's harder f to learn for, um, for new people. Uh, but you don't have to throw it away because it works. And also there are converters between the two. If you want to try coroutines, you can just uh, find the converters from Rx to coroutines. Um, so just a bit more comparison. Uh, completable in Rx is kind of similar to launch, behaves similarly. Uh, single is kind of similar to async, it, just that async will deliver errors and results. Um, cancel uh, scheduler, some particular like IO scheduler with a single, it would be something like with context, kind of similar behavior and also a zip of singles like multiple things that you need to wait for to complete it would be something like coroutine scope so it's not exactly the same of course but just to be able to to compare a bit um, and finally about coroutines test test and test and check because we kind of had three or four weeks of work preparing for coroutines updating everything and then we figured out, oh wait, but our errors are delivered for some reason. We lose network and the error is delivered, so why is this happening? So that's why I'm saying, that's the whole point of this talk, just test. Don't assume that it will work the same as Rx or some other framework. Just check, read the docs. They might not be the most helpful docs, but they're okay. And just test a lot. So that's pretty much it.